How the right wing hacked the media and how we can hack it back. Matt Robeson, Blue Amp Channel, Beyond Politics Podcast. What we've done today is we've hacked into our friend Greg Oliar's podcast called Prevail with his permission. He had a fascinating conversation with Blue Amp Channel co-host Cliff Schechter. He's a former Biden campaign ad writer and a longtime Democratic communications consultant who knows all about the backstory of how the right wing seemed to capture American media. We wanted to bring it to you, so check it out. And don't forget, at the end, go to Greg Oliar's Substack. It's also called Prevail. Check that out. Subscribe to that. It's a great read. Cliff Schechter, welcome to the Prevail Podcast. Thanks for having me, man. I've been looking forward to coming on. When you were on the 5-8, you said... I can't remember if it was on camera or off that it was C-H-E-C-T. And you said that the second H was taken away at Ellis Island or something. And it was such a good thing to say because I always spell your name correctly now. I just wanted to just advice. I try to do that totally with people because, yeah, because for most people, the name is most of the time S-C-H-E-C-H. And I and so people do that. And I'm always like, I don't know if it was on the actual boat in the way over where they shaved the H off or it was at Ellis Island, but somewhere they cut it off. Yeah. I used to have a J in my name. It was O-L-E-J-A-R. And that is long oh. gone also. So maybe your H and my J are together somewhere in some exactly. they're, weird they're file in the ocean cabinet somewhere and like some kind of reenactment of Titanic or yeah. what? No, let me ask you this. What kind of name is Ola? Is it Olahar? Is that what it's, it was? It's, it's just Oliar. It's pronounced the same way. It's Eastern European, Slovakian, I think. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. So everyone wants to put an apostrophe in it and make me Irish. And I'm like, I'm not. <laughs> Oliar. Even, I'm not Irish at all, which is funny. I hate to disappoint people. Okay. Well, so they make one, I've got really light skin and blue eyes. So they always want to make me Irish too. And neither am I. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, so two uh, non-Irish guys talking. So you have this Blue Amp channel on YouTube. You've done ads and messaging for Biden. Before that, for Gore, Bloomberg, and Warren Buffett. You've written columns, and you wrote the book about McCain, the real McCain. I wanted to, so Before we get started, just tell everybody a little bit about yourself. How did you get into politics? Because <clears throat> you didn't go to school for it. You went to school for history and stuff like that and international yeah. affairs. And now you find yourself in the middle of all this weird domestic political stuff. So how exactly did that happen? Great and fair question. And I will give the short version because the long version is a long and winding road to quote some people that, you know, where you look back and you're like, I don't know how the hell I got here. But I, my yeah, my interest was always in history. That's what I was in undergrad and legal affairs. So I thought I was going to be a lawyer. And when I decided not to do that. You know, the part of history that had always fascinated me was political history. So that's what I always studied. And then, but I'd found U U.S. history as well as world history fascinating. So I ended up coming out of undergrad and doing some domestic political work. The timeline will say I went to, I worked on Bill Clinton's reelection at his polling firm with two of the worst human beings, no, three in the history of the world at the time. Okay. So the three guys that were coming out of that po that polling firm, but Dick Morris, that's what, yep, Dick Morris, Mark yep. Penn, and Doug Schoen, all of whom rapidly became Fox News Democrats because they're three of the sleaziest humans alive, as far as I'm concerned. That's an opinion, guys, if you feel like suing me. And they, and so after that experience, I went back to School of International Public Affairs at Columbia for international affairs. I'd lived abroad in both France and England, and I thought I was going to be an international journalist or something of that nature. But life sort of weird things happened, and I got these offer to work at a polling firm in Washington, D.C., Work, went there and I love domestic politics came important. And you mentioned, I'll skip over stuff, but you mentioned the really big thing before, which was some of the issues that, that we just could not tackle and seem to not be able to, and we've done, we've made progress, let's say. I don't want to be complete pessimist, but guns being a big one. Yeah. I was recruited because some people knew me and I did some PR on the side when I was studying in grad school. And I, and I talked to people, so it wasn't actually Michael Bloomberg I worked for, it was what was then Mayors Against Illegal Guns, which he started. And then what be, has become every town for gun safety. And this was 2005, six, seven. And the Bloomberg people, let's just say, have money to pay consultants. <laughs> I had a kid and I wouldn't have done it if it wasn't what I believed in, but they needed a lot of help on like, they didn't know how to talk to the left because Bloomberg, of course, on so many things was more conservative on economic issues, but his base on guns was gonna be. So they needed me to translate and help them promote and explain to them in this new crazy world. I know this will sound nuts, at the Huffington Post or Daily Beast or Daily Coast or whatever it was, they didn't get, at the time I was like, guys, if I push your stuff and put them on those channels, millions of people will see it. You're still getting psyched when you land an op-ed in like the Indianapolis Star. I'm like, that's not the world we're moving into. It'll end up in the Indianapolis Star if it's about Indiana anyhow. But 
So I helped them create their digital program. And then I went on from there. You said Buffett. I actually, it was the Buffett Foundation. They do a lot of work on women's health. And I did some work for them. And with Gore, it was the Alliance for Climate Protection. And just, I had about almost a decade where that was mostly what I was doing until I, well, I'd written videos for Bloomberg, written scripts and produced them and somehow found myself partnering up with somebody. And then in the COVID era, I, we got a call from my partners, like an old sort of business associate. It was like, the Biden people need people who can write ads and write them quickly. And we were just like, all right, pay us X a month. And we'll, this is one of the most important elections of my lifetime. And we desperately need the pus-filled, orangina colored demon <laughs> to lose. I went and did that. And so I wrote some ads for them and some other stuff. And now I have a large list, email list, where I do fundraising for good candidates and causes, I would say. And then I still do PR and write the occasional ad. That's and then I started the YouTube channel because yeah, I don't have enough things to do, clearly. Yeah, yeah. No, me, me too. Same thing. I'm like, ah, <laughs> I have four jobs. Let's do this YouTube show. It'll be fun. That's how it works. Okay, I have a long list of questions. This is just stuff to talk about now. Sure. Because I want to pick your brain on some of these things. So you've worked a little bit more closely with the Democrats, with the Biden people. You know maybe more of the thinking there. It seems to me that the fascists are just, they're just on the rise in this country. And the main problem messaging wise is that the Republican Party is basically the zombie Republican Party. It's the Republican mm -hmm. Party in name only. It's full on been co-opted by Trumpy fascists. They're not interested in governing. They're not interested in cooperation or compromise, which is how every legislative thing that's ever happened in the history of this country has happened. Well, the whole theory Even, of democracy in the yeah. republic is you have to work together. <laughs> yeah. So if you're going to obstruct, if you're going to just be like, no, I'm not going to do that. Fuck you. It's not going to work. Even in the in the decades up to the Civil War, you see the word compromise. Was the Missouri right. compromise and this year's compromise. And these are people that literally they were fighting. There were fisticuffs in Congress and they still got shit done. And now it's there's one party that the lion's share of the people in that party refuse to do any governing. Why does the media not report on it that way? Will they ever start? And how can we get them to go there? What do you think? So good. Thank you for this topic, because it's one I rail about often. The way I look at the Republican Party, and I should have looked up what animal, what creature it is, but it's like there's this horrific, it's horrifying video somewhere of these ants that attack a creature and then take over it, it, kill it, and then take over its brain and actually maneuver it around to do things. Like it's a zombie at that point. That's the Republican yeah. Party. Like they throw, they like to throw up Mitt Romney and people like that that seem normal on the outside, but it's the MAGA guys that are the ants inside maneuvering this thing, as we yeah. know. Um, and there's a number of problems, obviously. The media and folks that worked in that media, Mark Jacobs is a great one. What's his, oh, John Harwood who got fired from CNN once the new folks took over because he was too honest about stuff. There's some folks that just refuse to play the both sides game. Our media fell into this kind of model of nonpartisan media, and we're just gonna tell you the, what's going on. There's gonna be some fairness on this side, some fairness on that side. So the Republican party started hacking that system at least 50 years ago, right? Yeah. Slowly, you'll see in the 1970s, the early 70s, the creation of a, no, no, and I'll try to, I don't want to, I don't, I'll make jokes along the way. I don't want to bore people. I know this is an intellectual show <laughs> and everybody gets is interested in the weeds, but you'll see between about 73 and 78, the American Enterprise Institute's created ALEC, which yeah. is the American legislative corrupt every, can I curse on here or no? Fuck yes. Corrupt every motherfucker in the Republican Party. I think it's, that's what it stands for, if I remember correctly. <laughs> the NRA in the infamous, and I live here, Cincinnati Revolt, where they had their meeting here, and the hardliners kicked out the moderates and, and the radicals who are white supremacists. These are all forerunners to where we are today. And these were all people that weren't going to compromise, that were going, we didn't believe in democracy, and they start pushing. So this has been going on for a long time. The problem is that our media got stuck in this era of the 40s to, I would even say even the 80s, and you could even say the 90s pre-impeachment, because there still were a lot of Jim Jeffords and John Chafee, he's not even Lincoln, his dad, John Chafee, and hell, you're in New York, I grew up in New York, Jacob Javits was like a liberal Republican to the point where he was more liberal than two thirds of the Democratic Party, maybe more. So there were different wings of different parties and having that sort of both sides thing made a lot more sense. It hasn't made sense since Newt Gingrich's rise. Yeah. Since at the very least since Gingrich's rise, and you can make the argument since Reagan's second term, and he put Buchanan in a position of power. And I mean, the it, it's obvious, it's right in front of their faces. And the argument I always make is 
political media is the only type of media that actually tries to make you dumber actively. Like if we know that it would be like, and this is what I always repeat, I'm like, and I may have said this on your show, so I apologize if I'm repeating myself, but okay. but it would be like the one group of scientists say the moon is made of Swiss cheese. The others say it's not. Who's right? Or right. if they, if that would be if they covered science, all science that way, or the Dodgers had two runs and the Giants had one run. Did the Dodgers win? We'll ask both sides. Like objective realities are then, they, so in politics instead, they know Newt Gingrich comes in bad faith. They know Mike Huckabee comes in bad They've seen these people for years. Liars who've been caught lying, who've been caught in ethics violations. I named two people there because they're two of the early ones I can think of. But like Mike Huckabee sent out something on his Newsmax bought list saying he had a biblical cure to cancer and raised money on that. Newt Gingrich, we know what, you know, with GOPAC, he corrupted all these things and taught Republicans how to refer to Democrats as sick and evil. And we know who these people are. They're frauds. But the media still refuses to step out of that crouch. And, I, and the biggest, I think the problems are it's careerism with some folks. Like they don't want to step out of line because when everybody actually gets just one big conspiracy, that's not it. If you've ever right. worked yeah. in a culture before, you get that you have to adhere to that culture or you may be pushed out. Publishers are largely conservative still. And then some of the stuff we can't help, the stuff we can help is we have failed. And I don't know why, because you name some of the people I worked for. I've worked for people that put a lot of money into causes on the left. But we have barely ever even tried to create a parallel but truth-based left media that we've got some magazines that do this, New Republic or this nation or whatever, although the nation with Vanden Heuvel and some stuff veered off into, I'm yeah. sure, interesting territory. But we've got, there are a few newspapers here and they're owned by people on the left that, you know, that are willing to do this. Courier News has done some of this, Heartland Single. I'm not going to say nobody, Media Matters, of course, and I'm not saying nobody has, but we don't provide the pressure on the left to the mainstream media that they do on the right, which is why some people will say to me, why are you being viciously over the top? And my answer always is because that's all they respond to. Yeah. If they respond to, I went to school with a lot of these folks. I babysat one of them who you would have seen on TV this weekend. I should probably just say his name again and embarrass him. Another one was a good friend of mine in high school and they both write for the New York. I don't know, should I say them? Should I not say them? Who knows? I don't know. We can leave it up to the, to, to the listeners' imagination. Though. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. And they do some good work here and there, but they also do some of this both sides bullshit. And they're only going to respond if they're being, because at this point, you don't have these working class journalists anymore. It's people going to name brand schools, often from wealthy families. They're not going to be hurt by some of the stuff that they're talking about. So what I would say is you want to pressure them. It's not going on Twitter and saying, fuck you, but it's going and telling the truth and being like, this piece was absolute garbage. How could you have licked blow? How could you write a piece yeah. that say, says that Russians and Trump have no relationship a week or 10 days before an election? How the fuck could you fall for that? You know what I mean? And if you want to put it nicer, that's fine. But that's what needs. And if we had a bigger media apparatus the way they do, I think we could get the media to do better. But it's very hard. There's, and again, I saw you when you spoke to Matt, my partner at the YouTube, to Matt Robeson. You were more generous than me. And I, I'm fine. And so was Matt, where you said you think most of the media are doing good work or whatever. I would probably say some. I would say there, I'm very careful to say that there's some great folks out there. I mentioned Harwood and I mentioned Mark Jacobs. I mentioned others that have worked in, in Rex Hupke right now, Will Bunch. There's yeah. people that are, they write some columns, but they also do news and whatever, and they're terrific. But there's also way too many people out there who will just, they'll go on. They're either fully corrupted and you can tell who they are by various interests, or they don't give a damn. Right? It's all just a spectacle to them. And I don't know if they care if democracy falls. I don't know if they understand what enemy of the people means. And that if they're eventually, if democracy did fall and we went to the worst possible imagined future, they'd get a reserved seat on the cattle car right next to me. But they don't seem to get that. So I, it, my answer to you is the only way you're ever going to get media to move to where they need to be is by pressuring the hell out of them constantly. Yeah. It's it, you bring up a lot of good points. Plus, the I, the monolith thing, I think, is really important to understand because th these things are not monoliths. The New York Times is the most frustrating, <sighs> schizophrenic body that we have. Like it, one, they're terrible about, for example, trans rights. Their coverage of all this trans stuff has been wretched. It's been deplorably abhorrent to the point where people are going to die because of how shitty it is. 
And then in the same news cycle, they produce really good work about this scoop or that scoop. And the irony is that we know what we know because of these media stories, which they break. And uh, that's what I mean when I say that a lot of the journalists on the ground are doing good work. I think it's more the institutions themselves, the structures that are in place. I worked at AP in human resources, so I used to go to the news meeting and observe it. And it's interesting to see how that works. Like you have people right. pushing stories, and but the people know what is, quote, news and what isn't news. And everybody has a sort of, but that's a very subjective thing to you know, it to is, say yeah. to some degree, there's some, some things clearly are not subjective. Joe Biden won the election. That's not subjective, but yeah. that's a news story. But other things, maybe we're not going to report about Iran right now, for example, that has gotten very little play in, in the media, what's going on there. And other stories have disproportionately large amounts of play, like the fucking balloon or whatever. So it's all very frustrating. Um, but you brought up an important point. You said, and again, to quote you from that show, I've enjoyed that podcast with you. Sorry, I, I just- No, I'm uh, glad. I always, I, I hate watching myself after, so I'm glad I you do watched too. it. <laughs> I do too. Like I, watching myself is tough, watching other people, easy. Uh, you brought up the fact of the lack of context. And that yes, is what's so yes. difficult, is that when you say like these investigatory scoops, right? So I go on every couple of weeks on Mary Trump's show. I am a quote nerd avenger of which there are I don't know how many of us okay. she invites on but a bunch a bunch of folks that you see on Twitter and places Dahlia Lithwick and Wajahat Ali and Dean Abadala and good Jen Tao, really talented smart people outside of me somehow they let me in there to bring everybody drinks or so. I was like <laughs> I'm like Michelle Bachman in that debate that time I just bring everybody water is what I <laughs> but when, but Mary Trump when she released those we know now the taxes that originally became that tax story for Trump huge story she's well, in Craig yeah so that was a great great investigative piece. And I guess what my point is, they still do a great investigative journalism there. Yes. I don't go after those guys at all. It's their political analysis desk, their politics <sighs> desk that fucking sucks and undermines the great work because the investigation side will create a piece like that. Your own newspaper created this tax piece. So every time when Donald Trump brings up the issue of taxes to give people context, that should be referred to and it would even be in your own interest because you broke the fucking story but they don't they let it go down the memory hole like they do a few pieces on it and then if there's a new angle to it a year or two later they'll bring that up right when we, when the house committee got a hold of his taxes and those were released there were some more stories but they don't constantly provide the context what i said with mike huckabee before they don't say do we believe what mike huckabee is saying about climate change we did try to sell people a biblical cure to cancer if that's going to give you context into who this guy is so maybe when he says there's no climate change and more guns make you safer and we should take women's rights away maybe you should question that and that's the kind of context the political desk refuses to do because if they did it, 90% of it probably would be hitting Republicans. And it's not that I'm saying Democrats are great. I can criticize Democrats all day long. It's just comparatively, we have one party that does a lot of what it says it's going to do. And another party where it's all just become a joke. It's all performance. Yeah. Like it's failed Instagram stars and reality TV and former talk radio hosts. It's somebody, I think it was Jared Yates Sexton, if you ever read his. Yeah, we've been talking, LB and I have been talking about that, his point that he made for years now. All these guys, are they're all failed actors, failed comics, yep. failed models, failed I mean, go through musicians. All There's Tim Why did Breitbart move out to L.A.? He moved out to L.A. to become an actor. He failed and he started Breitbart. Yeah. He wanted to be an actor and a comedian. They hate the mainstream of America because the mainstream didn't find it interesting. Dana Loesch, NRA, I'll get as many people killed by the NRA because I want my face on TV. She literally pitched a quote unquote hot mom sitcom to NBC with her. And like when this whole thing about this, I guess it's amateur way to get your picture out there in front of people that are like casting for movies, explore talent. Yeah. Candace Owens, Lauren Boeber, like the list goes on and on. This nut that they've just exposed, Anna Paulina Luna, her whole thing was she wanted to be an Instagram star and a model. It's just, it's one after another. It's these people that had brushes with fame and crave, they're such narcissists or they just want to make easy money and they crave the money and the fame and the whatever. And Anna Paulina Luna was a strong Obama supporter in 08. Carrie Lake was a strong Obama supporter. But these people then found out, hey, wait a minute. Look at all these morons here on the right who will buy a biblical cure to cancer. I can sell them anything. And the right is smart enough to get that they're looking for people that have, who actually, even if they're amateur actors and suck, at least have tried to be actors. Oh my God, have you seen the thing with 
the Project Veritas guy trying to do like a cat, new kids on the block thing? I, I mean, saw like... the clip, but I saw the link to the clip and I did not click the link because I did not have bleach readily available. I'm, I saw it because it was on Twitter and it started playing for me. I'm like, oh, I, you know, I saw it probably yeah. for about 10 seconds before I was like, what did I just see? And I talked about this. I released a video last night on this newest one. I don't even know how to pronounce this la stupid last name. I, mean, I don't really care. It's probably a fake name. Anyhow, we've learned Andy Ogles or whatever, the one from Tennessee. You know, His name, Cliff. His name is Ogles. I know. It's, it's cast what, what's next? Fondles? Molest? Exactly. I mean, right. Come on. I'm reading this and I'm like, Wait a minute, his name is Ogles and he's Republican. I used to say this, like their names too. If you, did you ever look, and people may know this, but the, the, what Malkin means as in Michelle Malkin, oh, it's, it's like a bird that, hara I mean, like Coulter, like all these people's names are like, have these horrible associations and Ogles fits right in there. Yeah, Everybody totally. will be Googling Malkin and Coulter. You should, because she's, I can't remember, I don't offhand, but they've, so point being Ogles and like, he was calling himself an economist for years. You know what? We actually have degrees in that. We hand them out at institutions of learning. He doesn't have one of those degrees, so he doesn't get to do that. He referred to himself as an expert. I don't even know what this means. On international sex trafficking, an expert, does that mean he did it with Matt Gates, who now won't be charged, but probably should? I don't know. But he had made all these claims about himself, that his resume, that none of which are true. And it's just another example in all this. And that's what I spoke about like in this video is that the end goal used to be like you want you cared about policy, even if you're coming from the right, you would generally had I mean there are demagogues along the way. There your Tillmans and your McCarthy's and your but you generally wanted maybe you want to do something you believed in. Like now the end goal isn't to be a congressman or a senator, it's to get like a Fox News kid. Yeah. It's to end up on the right wing gravy train where you can go to you can go go online to a QAnon conference and get paid a hundred grand to just show up and say stupid things that you know not to be true and obviously we learned all of that not that we didn't know it with these the, the fox news dominion yeah, with the dominion sure. which I, to me oh my god can i give you my shocked face i knew these all these people are lying i knew all of them didn't know it's the question of our age and some of it's you and i don't remember if we talked about it before we came on air about how easily money travels now from place to place and how easy it is to bribe people. An article just came out on all the, and you probably saw it, all the various EU officials that were being bribed and whatever by Putin's Russia to try to change their stance on Ukraine. Oh, no, Crimea, I think it was specifically at the time. Yeah. And, but what else, tra what else is really easy is, and we're in an age of weaponized communication. Yeah. And I've tried to have conversations and you get these First Amendment absolutists and I'm like, listen, we regulate things that we consider to be dangerous. You, you can't, issue terroristic threats we you, you we have you can't commit acts of sexual harassment you can't share child porn you, you can't know. slander yeah slander libel but we were we refused to have this conversation and i'm not saying how much regulation there should be but one of the guys who shared the guy who's just just had his had his, it was his sentencing the mass murderer in boston okay uh, i'm sorry buffalo yeah right. market racist whatever you know well, one of the folks who encouraged him and shared his vision and all stuff in the United Kingdom just got sentenced to a 14 year sentence for that. We can't do that here. We yeah. and you can share any. And I'm not saying maybe that's going too far. I don't know. But we refuse to even have the conversation about the fact that it used to be somebody, whether they believed in it or not, whether they're fake like Fox or not, who could stand on the corner and scream crazy shit and maybe convince five people if they're lucky to do crazy shit. Now they have access to the entire world via social media. And they if they lie again and again with just the right music and just the right graphics and just all this kind of brain fuckery, like we see what Fox News does to people, turns them into zombies. And I don't know what we're going to end up doing about this, but we, do, but we allow them to call themselves news. They go into a courtroom and say, we're not news, we're entertainment. So they don't get held responsible. But then right. we allow them to show up at the White House and ask questions like they're a news station. And I just don't yeah. fucking understand it. This is what I'm getting at with the, the Democrats need to and the media needs to call this shit out. Now, you mentioned social media. I've been writing a lot about Elon, not as much recently about Elon Musk and Twitter, because I even the day before the buyout happened, I wrote a piece called Tower of Bab Elon saying that's basically what was going to happen. And everything that I said would he would do, he's done because my position is that he's a chaos agent and he's there to destroy it or subvert it in some way, which is China, what's happened. You think? I don't I have no idea who he's working for, but or and maybe he's working for himself and he's just a fucking asshole. But the end yeah. result is he's letting the Nazis He's not letting, he's let all of the Nazis back on. Yep. And now 
some of the new stuff that he's doing, he's which people are making fun of him and calling him like, oh, he's so insecure because he wants to we make sure to see his tweet. He's he's but pathetic. the reason he's doing that, it seems to me, is because he's tweeting out shit that his overlords, his whore masters want to be seen. And he yeah. has to make sure that everybody sees it, no matter what it is, whatever the message is that is people get out there, it, it gets out. So now he's been pretty not subtle about promoting no. Putin stuff. And the the anti Taiwan stuff. He's not. I don't no. get it. He's not. He's from South Africa. We don't even know if his immigration was legal. From what I've read about it, it's a little bit dodgy there. I don't understand how we let a South African and Australian come into the United States, no matter how long they're here, or how much money they have, and fucking poison our discourse and ruin I don't our media. It makes no I sense. Should, to as far me. as I'm just deport him. Seriously, yeah. if you can. Or I've got a real problem. And again, what I think. As you, as you probably know, cultures take a while to change. Yeah. And the problem is like we, and I don't want to cast aspersions on some of our older leaders who I think legislatively were incredible, right? Nancy Pelosi will probably end up on the Mount Rushmore of legislators, stuff that she got. Through. I don't want her on Mount Rushmore. I want her on the fucking $20 bill in a few years. Okay. That's so you I mean. obviously appreciate her too. Yes. She, she, it would never take her 15 rounds to vote on anything. She knew when she had the votes, she, she was incredible. But what I would say is some of the older leaders, some of the ones in their 70s and 80s, couldn't get themselves out of this era of the 80s and even early 90s where people got where both parties got together and there still were different wings of different parties. You could have you could have Hal Heflin or whatever in the Democratic Party, and you had this whole New England wing and West Coast wing of the Republican Party. And they couldn't get themselves out of that, that this sort of this thing that was enunciated by Pat Buchanan as many as 50 years ago has basically slowly taken over the Republican Party. And then after Trump came in, it literally shot on steroids. And it's just not the same thing anymore. You're they're putting your lives in danger and having yeah. attacks on the Capitol. Your husband is being hit with a hammer because they're trying to kill you. I'm not saying specifically Pelosi, but this is a lot of these folks who I just think we needed this new generation to come in. Because if you see the video that has gone the most viral on my channel is Dan Goldman literally beating the living shit out of these bullshit witnesses on their fucking Un-American Activities Committee, which is really the Defend Trump from Being Prosecuted Committee. And I almost love watching it because it looks like they're going to cry and maybe close down the committee or try to figure out a way to kick Dan Goldman off because he fucking destroys them. Uh, one, one of the other ones that's done the probably the fourth or fifth best video on my channel is Eric Swalwell standing up when they went after Ilan Omar and be like, you guys are fucking saying and calling out anti-Semitism, you? The ones with the Soros conspiracies and the Jewish lasers and the... And what we used to have, and there's still a couple of folks like this in positions of leadership would say, I'm not going to dignify that with a response or, oh, that, that's ridiculous, but that's just Republicans being Republicans. No. You need to fucking play this game the way they play this game. Every time somebody puts a mic in front of your mouth, that is a messaging moment. It is a moment to share with not just your base, but low information voters, you know, who you are and who yeah. they are. And for years, we have let them get away with this bullshit, of even pushing garbage. I make this connection all the time. In 2016, Ted Cruz and even Carly Fiorina, who now is like a born again Democrat who has rejected the Putinites, but she's responsible for this as anybody, Fiorina, Cruz, I feel like one or two others stood up on that fucking stage and said, Demo and used the example of that, that doctored bullshit video, Democrats are killing live babe. Literally within days, an unhinged man in Colorado Springs walks into a Planned Parenthood, he said history of mental health issues, and kills a number of people. He's saying the words body parts or literally quoting from Ted Cruz and Carly Fiorina. And we decide that's not terroristic threats or that's not. So these are the things they're saying about us. And then our people are responding, oh, the Republicans. And no, you point out that Matt Gates has issues with sex trafficking. I don't care. He was charged whether they end up indicting him or not. You point out the issues. These guys will make something out of Hunter Biden's fucking laptop to the point where they're pushing the, that there's a problem because we didn't all see his penis like they did on Twitter which they can deal with their own issues. You know what? Like they're doing stuff that's in such bad faith and we won't even in the past call them out on that. But now Katie Porter, Ted Lieu, I don't care what, throw aside ideology if you're more of the left, center left, middle of the Democratic Party. I'm just talking about effectiveness now. AOC, Ted Lieu. This new guy, Maxwell Frost, is really fucking good at it. Maxwell too, Frost is He's awesome. He's amazing. He's been Ruben there for Gallego. two weeks. He's amazing. Yep. 
Yeah. Ruben Gallego, who's taking on one of the reasons everybody got behind him is because he was the one who was willing to go on Twitter and call Ted Cruz a baby killer when he tried to give us his theory of doors to stop shootings. Yeah. But doors were only shoot stronger, which I'm sure would help at parades and stuff. We have people now who are willing. Katie Porter sitting there reading like that book, you know, how to not give a fuck or whatever it was. That is a, that, believe it or not, like that's, and I know you know this, but everybody might not, that is a messaging moment because th that ended up going viral. And it's Democrats understanding that you need to mock them. You need to point out their lies and inconsistencies. You need to go after them for their, how dangerous they are and how anti-American they are. And that's the way you win against these folks. We're getting better, is what I would say. I am not, to be clear, attached to the Biden administration. I wrote ads in 2020. Never, that's it. It was never in the administration. I probably, whether I get hired again is questionable because I'm willing to be critical and I say things. I think under a very difficult circumstances, Joe Biden has literally done a masterful job legislatively. And I think he moved us forward. He's been going after Rick Scott on Social Security yep. and hitting him and mocking him. He at least brought the F word to the conversation when he said semi-fascism. I wish he just said fascism. But to say MAGA Republicans are semi are semi fascist that is a big deal for Democrats. Sure. So do I want him to still be tougher? Do I want him to be better? Do I want him to be hit them hard? I do. But some of his persona is like the ah, likable Joe guy. And, I, and in a way that gives him even more license to do it. Because yeah. women can say, my, my friend Mitch McConnell, the next minute you need to be like Berkeley slitting his throat. You yeah. know what I mean? And he started doing that. And I think, so even he is, he's learning at this point, but it, an old dog learning new tricks, it's hard with some of the folks who are in the upper echelons of the Democratic Party. So when you're talking about Democrats calling them out on all this stuff, we are getting a lot better at it because yeah, we have this whole new generation that wasn't, that only knows the post Bush two Republican party yeah. and what they've been. Yeah. You know? They see the light. Yeah, yes. they see it for what it is. We got to take a quick break. We're going to be right back with Cliff Schechter. Okay, we're back with Cliff Schechter. I don't. I was going to save this to the end, but let's just get it out of the way. I just because... talk too much. You got to. I need to. No, I, I'm, no I don't, I'm not going to do that. I have a bunch of questions, and if we don't get to them, it's fine. I just wanted to All chat. Right. I think you were talking about Biden's accomplishments. My opinion is that Biden, and I've said this a bunch of times on a bunch of platforms, Biden is the best president of my lifetime which is both acknowledging the good work he's doing and also an indictment on the presidents that have been in my lifetime, I think. It's not, I'm born in 72. Nixon, so we're, we're you were pretty much exactly the same age. Yeah, exactly. It's the same thing. You could make arguments for other people, but I think it's I think it's pretty obvious, actually. I want to put this- I agree with you. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I want to put it to bed. Historically speaking, as being a history guy, Incumbent presidents don't lose re-election unless they really fuck up bad or they're super unpopular. Yes. Biden is doing or they get awesome stuck work. in an all in an awful economic cycle. Although yeah. in Republicans' cases, they often create that. But go ahead. Yeah, there's reasons, but for the most part, you really have to bungle something. Or Ross Perot. There, there's forces yeah, yeah. that are weird that come along. But if it's a president that's running and he's pretty popular and everything seems to be going okay. It's usually a cakewalk to re-election. That's usually historically what happens. Is very, so, there's a lot of free media and yeah. name recognition and money that comes with being an incumbent. Absolutely. Yeah. The advantages of incumbency are vast, et cetera, et cetera. Now, Joe Biden is old. In two yes. years, he will be older or next year, whatever yes. it is. I am worried. I think people don't really appreciate just how much depends on his health, frankly. I think yeah. Joe Biden's health is more important than almost anything right now. Oh, I remember saying yeah. when COVID, I was like, let's put him in a bubble. Literally have him be like the bubble boy. Don't let anything no, get don't near let him. anything near him. But so my thing is there's a lot of this bullshit. And again, the media doing the stupid shit that they do. Let's not have Biden. Maybe it's time for someone else because he's old and he's yesterday's news or whatever. I think that's madness. I think there's no fucking way that you, if you're, if you're Michael Jordaning it, you don't retire. You keep going until you lose. Is yeah, my position. he just turned sixty the other day? By the way, he probably could still go out there and beat at least half the NBA. Yeah. So I, yes, if you're good. Yeah, I think that that is true. What I'm getting at here is, is that your position too? Do you agree that he should run, or what's your thoughts on this? So two two answers to the two things you said. And again, my loyalty to Biden at this point is as an American who thinks he's yeah. done an outstanding job. I do not, in any capacity, work for them, and I don't expect to again, and I'm not trying to again. But let me start with, he's clearly been the best president of my lifetime. I think there's absolutely no question. It was sad the other day, yesterday, to see that Jimmy Carter going into hospice now. Yeah. And I would say, 
oh my god is that presidency looking a ton better with the solar panels on the roof and the you know imagine if we'd embraced environmentalism in the late 70s but and i did work for bill clinton so uh, so people want to say oh you're just saying that because you worked for biden guess what i worked for bill clinton too so what biden has done is exactly what i've, I've said democrats have needed to do forever and no one has done this and it is which is one you completely to the public and I thought Obama was doing this for a while until Obama proved that he really believed what he was saying. And that got me upset, which is you claim the bipartisanship. You can work with them. People like that. You have to do that. Yeah. You don't want to normalize their crazy, but you can, if you do it in a smart way, which he's done, which is he separates MAGA Republican from Republican. And now you can call anybody a MAGA Republican if you want any of the other ones. But you where you need to, you go it alone. You bring your party along and the masterful job when you have such a slim majority of getting both that initial COVID stimulus bill through, which is why our economy came back because so many people were able to go back to work suddenly. There was right. so much purchasing power again. And then later on, the Inflation Reduction Act, which dealt with inflation, but investments in clean energy and all these were huge. But the fact that he also was willing to go at the bipartisan route and know when it was in Republicans' interests and he could bring a few sane people along, but also bring people along that really needed shit, right? Mitch McConnell, and Moran Paul were never the big project, and he spoke about this in the State of the Union. The Brent Spence Bridge is one of the ways you get from where I live in Cincinnati across the river to Kentucky. Not that we want to go there very. I'm kidding. Like Kentucky. But <laughs> that's where the good. Thing. That's where the good whiskey is, though. Come on now. It actually bourbon is outstanding there. I will say, and if you come to this area, I will take you to, on the bourbon trail. It's good stuff. But a lot of folks live in the northern. It's the way you'd live in the New Jersey suburbs or Connecticut suburbs of New York. Like you can live in Indiana and. Kentucky suburbs, you take bridges over and come to Cincinnati and work. And this bridge had chunks falling out of it. And no, the governors have never been able to get the money. Like the state legislatures are full of fucking idiots and they refuse to do it. His bringing that, that, those funds in here to quote himself was a big fucking deal. And the fact that he got McConnell to come along because it was in McConnell's interest to do it. It was in Mike DeWine's interest to do it. DeWine's from this area too. He wants that bridge fixed, but he doesn't want to put any of the state budget into it. When he knows it's an economic engine, people needed to drive a fucking across to get to work. Yeah. So he brought along the dozen or whatever he did on that infrastructure bill, which I mean, the economic development, the job creation of that bill was just astounding. Yeah. He did on guns. It wasn't a nearly good enough gun bill, but as somebody who's very steeped in that issue, we had loopholes like what we would call the dating loophole, which meant that if you were, if you'd committed an act of domestic violence, it was defined as you had to live with somebody, have a child with them, or be married to them. If you just were dating them or stalking them, it was a stalker's paradise. You could stalk somebody and you weren't living with them. So even if there's, even if there are misdemeanor charges against you, still go get a gun. This closed that loophole, for example. He brought a bipartisan majority together and Republicans knew it was in their interest. They had to because they knew on guns with that series of shootings, our last series of major shootings, they had to do something that was right before the 22 election and they knew they were going to get destroyed if they didn't. So it was in their interest and they had to do it. So when he's needed to bring them along, he has. And I would put his economic record up there right now with certainly his legislative record is, is, approaches LBJs, his economic record approaches FDRs. I mean, his foreign policy record is up there with, with anybody. He's right. the best thing that he's done is how he's done the Putin stuff and the war yes. in Ukraine, I think. Putin and Ukraine getting us the fuck out of Afghanistan, which I'm sorry, had yeah. to happen. Absolutely. Afghanistan should have been, a, a, if it wasn't for Dick Cheney's oil and all the fucking people sitting around Bush, it should have been a six year, six month to one year invasion to go in with mostly special forces and take out Al Qaeda and take out the Taliban folks who were actually harboring them and get them getting the fuck out. Right. Because I'm sorry, I feel horrible for people. I do believe that international forces need to go in to stop genocides. But at the same time, if it's America in or the West in Afghanistan, it's never going to work. It, it doesn't. And history can tell you that from from us trying to do it in the Spanish, trying to do it in the Philippines, to where you pick your example that you want. It doesn't work because people will, they will outlast you. So he got us out of there. And that was huge, all right? And all the chaos that all these assholes wrote about afterwards, amazing. It actually ended up working better than planned in the long run. There was some short-term chaos that happens. That's why you try to not get into wars, because war is always chaos. What, he did, what he's done with Putin, as you said, has been and Ukraine has been masterful. Is he perfect? No, but he said this great record. And I would add, and I don't have to say much about the incumbency. You really covered it. 
So when you look at his great record and you look at the fact that he's an incumbent, we would be crazy not to have him run for re-election. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be insane. And here's the thing. It's really simple. As long as he stays healthy, like you have a preset script there. Look at Reagan 84 and all the shit Republicans did to us when Reagan going, oh, there he goes again and all that stuff. Just fucking take it at take steal wholesale all the stuff Reagan. I don't want anybody to hold it against my opponent that he's young and inexperienced. What he said about Mondale, they got to bring right. a laugh in that debate. There's a whole sort of record there of ways to deal with the age issue. They should be studying Reagan 84. Do it. You can deal with it. Yeah, especially if it's fucking DeSantis that's running, I think. Uh, Meatball, that's one of the nicknames that if Trump really did come up with that, it was the easiest one. The guy looks, he wears his little white booties to, to when there's a flood. I'm sorry, let me run that campaign. That guy looks, uh, I could, what I, his, this is, I'm sorry, I just have to do this. When he did his little Top Gun thing, and his face was like this in the fucking <laughs> helmet. Sorry, I yep. knocked this out. His face is because he, with the, the G-force on, on his chipmunk face. Let me do the, that's one place I would want to do ads. Let me do a few ads against Ron DeSantis. Not tough to beat. Nikki Haley never gets through a Republican primary. I still don't think we've seen who their nominee ends up being. I still think of those three, it's most likely Trump. If he's not in prison, if we don't do enough. But otherwise, I don't think we've seen who the person is who ends up maybe being a one that brings them together, all the nuts from the different wings who they can all agree upon. I think it's going to be Christy Nome. I'm just going to say it right now. That's, she's the I one that scares me. I think she absolutely could because she's if it's attractive. A, if and it's a woman, her shit. yeah, yeah. That's if they're smart. I don't know though, but pe people will argue that no, the GOP is so misogynistic that they would never. But I don't know. Do they want to win or not? That's so how many people are running? Because if there's a split enough vote, you don't need. If you can win the primaries with fifteen or twenty percent of the vote, there's yeah. enough people. She might be able to do that. I think she would be one of the ones. If you were going to go with. Someone who isn't a non-woman, I'd have to think a little bit, but there's a couple of them who I think could pull it off and still, you know, I guess he's, I don't think he's going to run anything he said he's not going to, but John Thune has this very air, another South Dakotan of you oh, know, being he reasonable. Was, he went to well, Moscow. He's one of the Moscow, he went I was to Moscow. Say, he's one of the he's Moscow the eight. So I think, but he has this look to him, like he fits in with the regular Republicans and he's quiet about stuff. He doesn't speak out and say crazy shit but you're right maybe moscow eight thing would be enough to destroy him but they do have a few they do have others out there who would make me more nervous another one is yunkin yeah he's a right winger who comes off like the private equity guy he is and or and so they there are some like they're gonna end up being compromised candidates who are still just as fucking nuts and just as fascist and those would be the ones who would worry me but again if biden is healthy and biden is our incumbent and we get the machine up and running, I feel pretty fucking good about things. Yeah, me too. And Marjorie Taylor Thanks Greene, we finally have also done what they done, what they did. They created caricatures of our leaders all the time. Nancy Pelosi, others that were just total bullshit, but they, were, but they did it with their media arm successfully. Here we have Marjorie Taylor Greene where like she gives us all the material we need and the Biden people have gotten smart on this too. And so have other, and the Democrats in the house. We, Kevin McCarthy literally is on a dog leash. It's like a scene out of Spinal Tap and to, <laughs> to her. And as far as I'm, it, it's not sexist, it's sexy. And you know what? We should run with that because the truth of the matter is that if she is the face of that party, they are, they are fucked. Yeah, I think that's, I agree with that. And it, you mentioned the Republican like machine that they have, the media machine of smearing people. You can see it with Kamala Harris. You could see it early on that yep. the forces that did not want her and they did not want Joe to win. And you could tell because that's who the Russians didn't want. And if you go like when I was doing the Kavanaugh articles, I went and read like Mark Judge's blog, which I don't mm -hmm. recommend. But you can tell he's workshopping ways to ha attack Kamala. And, and it's effective. She does no, well, have to see it. Where, yeah. So they're sitting there with whatever the new Cambridge Analytica is mm -hmm. and they're stealing and buying and as much data as they can. And they're pouring through it and finding different ways to try to convince African Americans not to vote and convince certain women to vote for them and what you know whatever it might be and what crazy shit works. And when you're willing to do that and you have literally zero morals and you have all this money and all this research you can do, sure you can workshop it because like I always say to people, if you can put just a few dots together, it isn't difficult to know what they're doing. Yeah. The border stuff is a classic example. Right. Like you, that's testing well in their little Cambridge Analytica focus groups. It's seeing that it blunts certain other issues for them and it appeals. Sadly, 
it seems to appeal to a lot of newer immigrants here who are like, I came here the legal way. Why? And they play that up and they, and they create this whole, because they need fear. They yeah. need fear of the other. And so you can tell crime, it, it wasn't based on reality. You know, it was based on what's the stuff that's playing in the focus groups and what's the stuff that we can find a way to connect to people that we can get people to hate LGBTQ community. Jews, yeah. blacks, like, and certain liberal hippie women, especially single women and that kind of thing. They yeah. have their games. They, so you can, if you know this stuff and you pay close enough attention, you know exactly what they're up to because when one or two people say certain talking points and you magically then see the same thing appear in other parts of right-wing media, they're testing stuff. And if yeah. it works, yeah. they're running with it. Yeah, exactly right. Exactly right. Okay. We're coming down on the hour. I don't want to keep you too long. I have a couple more questions. First no. of all, you mentioned Cincinnati. You live in Ohio. What the fuck is up with all the Nazis, man? What's going on with the Nazis in Ohio? I don't like this. When you say the Nazis in Ohio, do you mean our state legislature? Do you mean a couple of the Nazis that have been exposed here? Or do you just mean our overall voting patterns? <laughs> <laughs> I was talking about the home, the, uh, the uh, homeschooling group. Of Nazis. Oh God. Yes. But it's a, there there seems like there's just this rise of Nazis now. And I don't understand it. I feel like after the Second World War, like all of our media, the movies, TV shows, all this stuff, pretty much Hitler bad, Nazis bad. Yes. And yet here we are. So I don't well, get it's it. Well, not just What's Nazis. It's almost like they're rolling it all the way back to like Civil War times. And the thing that's crazy is when if you study history, like back when there was more of a regionality back then, Ohio was so proud to be a union state. Jesus, Grant came from here and Sherman. Yeah. And this, we did have, there were a couple of awful Southern Ohioans who joined with the cause of the Confederacy. But for the most part, and what's, I guess the answer to your question is the Nazis, the, the we had a gerrymandered state legislature here. We voted in to overturn the lines. And then the Republicans slow walked it as long as they could because they've taken over the federal courts and they knew the federal courts would say it was okay. Our Supreme Court with one Republican, old style moderate Republican had been there for 20, 30 years, kept joining with the three Democrats to say, you have to rewrite the lines. It made the lines marginally better because they had to keep submitting slightly better maps before the deadlines, but we should have thrown them in prison when they're in contempt of court. And that's what, this is where we're not tough enough and we don't oh, take the threat yes. seriously enough is when these people refused and were in contempt of court, they should have spent a couple of days in prison and seen how they liked it, or maybe a few weeks. State legislators, we're, it's no different in their state that way. We have these, we have the cities and the suburbs that have become incredibly liberal, especially it refers to the three C's here, Cleveland, Columbus, Cincinnati, but also even like the a little bit smaller cities, Toledo and Akron or whatever. But then you do have these rural swaths. I mean, Southeast Ohio might as well be West Virginia or Kentucky and the Western band of farmland might as well be Indiana. And what the issue here has been is just, we don't have a Philadelphia. We don't have a New York City. We don't have a Chicago, a city that is big enough and has enough of an influence to outweigh the rural vote. And because they've so radicalized rural voters, you can win some of them back. But what was really upsetting, and, and we did look, we changed the, we got one of the seats much better down here and elected a friend of mine who's Greg Lanzen, who was a city councilman to Congress and knocked out one of the insurrectionists Steve Shabbat, who'd been there forever. And there are some folks you can appeal to that are that like a lot of the sort of folks who are here who are like, kind of like Procter and Gamble or Kroger or some of the big companies here that used to be Republicans. I'd call them Romney Republicans or voting Democratic, but we're a couple points short. We come very close in, in the overall Congress vote, the state legislative vote, but the gerrymandering has hurt us. And what really upsets me is I think we get pegged as a more right wing state last time around. Trump appealed very specifically to, to lost jobs to NAFTA and things of that sort in a way that a lot of other Republicans don't. J.D. Vance is another meatball, right? Yes. So what hurt us last time, what was so upsetting is Tim Ryan was just the right guy for this state. Yeah. And every poll had them within two points for a while. And Tim Ryan might have lost, but if he had lost, he was going to lose at worst by three, maybe by two. But then that fucker obsessed with living forever loser, Peter Thiel, you know, J.D. Vance is essentially his puppy dumped. He had a deal with McConnell. He's like, if I put 30 million in, you have to put 20 million or vice versa. And they dumped $50 million in here. And so it's not that Ohio has suddenly become Alabama. It's that Ohio has, because of the rural areas, frankly, with their gun policies and their diabetes policies and their COVID policies, if there's any state where they're killing themselves off disproportionately actually has an impact over the next five to 10 years, it may be here. 
because wow. nobody's repopulating those rural areas and the cities here because we do have engines of growth the Ch children's hospital here is one of the best in the country we do have procter and gamble which brings a lot of folks to cincinnati who wouldn't otherwise come here the cities are growing so if we can hold off the fascists for about five years i'm sorry i'm just going to put this honestly enough of these other nuts in these areas because they're doing the worst possible things for their health imaginable it's where the opioid crisis is they're dying off and the truth is we're growing so they've got about a four point advantage here i'd say naturally if everybody spent the same amount of money and whatever we did they've got a th not even necessarily four three point maybe that's going to get a lot closer yeah i do think ohio can come back and a couple other states on the bubble like that that are very close can come back because of growth because of in rural areas and you've seen it somewhat in pennsylvania already are dying off in philly and pittsburgh and whatever are growing so my answer about ohio is we're salvageable yeah uh, like, that should I'm be you gonna, should put that on a bumper sticker we're ohio. salvageable yeah, we're, i'm not going to bullshit anybody i'm not going to say oh but it'll be interesting to see because they're going to throw everything they have at sherrod brown and there literally is no democrat who does better playing to a working class audience who's more comfortable with a jeans tuxedo in like a union hall or a trucker event than Sherrod Brown, who does win five to 10% crossover voters who vote for people like Trump. And he's an incumbent. It's not quite the incumbency of the presidency, but being an incumbent in any office is very helpful. Sure. And he's got a lot of name recognition. He's been a, you know, in the state statewide on and off now for 30 years, so he doesn't need to build it the way Tim Ryan needed to. So that's going to be a real test here, because if we can hold Sherrod Brown, I think then that will give folks hope. And I think we've got a lot of hope as our demographics increase and theirs decrease. Yeah, thanks for that answer. It's very sad. It's really sad to me. I know we we make fun of the MAGAs and we should and mock them and stuff, but that you have a political party, the Republican Party, that's actively trying to kill people. I think that's their policy. I've said this a bunch yeah. of times. They want us to die. Every, almost without exception, every piece of legislation and every plank on their platform, so-called, advances something that's going to cause as many people to die as possible. If you have a question like, should we do A or B? They will look at it and say- What will kill one? the most people? Yeah, and they'll go with that one. And I'm not even joking. That's how it is. And the people that are dying disproportionately from their the COVID, their COVID fuckery are their own voters. And it's just really fucking sad. It really is sad. Yeah. And I have a hard time because I try to balance my yeah. compassion as a human being with the fact that, look, I am the least religious person and I'm brought up in whatever. But trust me when I say Hitler would still find me Jewish. And when I realized that, that some of these folks that this stuff's happening to, they would happily throw me on a cattle car. And so- yeah. My compassion goes to a certain point, but people that would kill my children. No, I know. Oh, but, and they are. That's know, who they are. But, but you know, you're yeah. right with, with whether it's opioids. And then you see someone like J.D. Vance, who calls Donald Trump cultural heroin and points out how Trump is killing the very people that he'd been talking about in his half made up book. And then, of course, J.D. Vance starts a fake C3, a fake nonprofit on, on opioids and basically sends a member of Big Pharma out to push cotton as part of it. The evil that is contained in these people and there. I saw him, there's a local sort of fast food place. He lives literally five minutes from me here. Okay. And I saw I'm him sorry. with his kids. I know. I've only run into him this once though. And I ran into him this once in the place here and my younger son looked at me and was like, dad, don't do it. And because he knows, please don't embarrass me. Don't. And I'm like, you know what? You have no worry because you're here and his kids are there and I'm not going to do it to his kids. But what I would have said to him if it had been just me, I debated this guy three years ago on NPR where they had us on about, and he was at that time saying all the right things. He was like, I'm still conservative and hope for that vision, blah, 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 but would rip into Trump and the whatever. And I would have been like, yeah, you probably don't remember me, but I fucking remember you. And you think you've achieved something by being center. You had a billionaire throw a bunch of money behind you and you sold your fucking soul. There aren't a lot of us who couldn't pull that off. Trust me when I say half the people, if we were to do a, just look around this restaurant here, half the people in here, have far better personalities than you, JD, and they don't look like fucking meatballs. So you're just a soulless fuck who was willing to do whatever Peter Thiel and Don and Mitch McConnell and whatever told you to. Don't get all high on yourself. That's why you are where you are. In any case, the point being like, the, and the diabetes is horrible in these areas, right? They're eating awfully. They're, it's all become this own the libs shit, right? They're, yeah. It's like the smoking that was re-added to the house floor, or not the house floor, but their offices. That, that They're doing that too in Appalachia. And like, 
they're going. So I do have some sympathy, but I also realistically sit here and say, not to be a nerd and quote Spock about the greatest good for the greatest number of people or whatever, but I truly believe that way. And I'm sorry, a few percent less of these folks and are in elections in Ohio, making Ohio a true swing state that could go either way again, for the vast majority of the 12 to 13 million or whatever people that live here is going to make them healthier and better. And my compassion can only go so far. Yeah. Yeah. It's a whole thing. It's just so sad to me. It's just sad. It is. And uh, yeah, it's, ugh, it's just and There's sad. no way to win them because I always point out. No, you can see it's a lost On the Bernie left who would say stuff. And I'm not criticizing everybody. I have friends who worked for Bernie and I think. Oh, I'll criticize Bernie. The Bernie left ahead. is ridiculous. It's fucking ridiculous. Okay. okay there. Members of it. And I'm going when Nina Turner, who's from my state and I know is a fraud, has tried to run on stuff. I called her out. Other folks who were once friends of mine when they, before they looked at how the easiest way to get ahead on that side of things. I don't even want to go into it, but I'll say this when there, with our, the argument coming from there of, oh, you only need to get more progressive economically. Well, it's just bullshit. And we should get more progressive economically because it's the right thing to do. And you probably will convince more of your base to turn out by doing that. So I all agree with that. But you, you, when you tell me you're going to win folks, you know what? Sweden has a Nazi party. They have universal health care and like family leave policies where they get months off and go look at their social safety net. It's everything that a lefty could dream of in this country. Yet somehow they are still because they've had immigrants come there from Turkey in certain places. They're still able to use anti-immigration fervor and other stuff to have a Nazi party that wins a decent amount of the vote. So when you tell me, oh, if we just move to the left economically, I would tell you to look at Europe. And look at the fact that there's that Marie Le Pen still does very well in France, and they've got probably the best universal health care system in, in the world in France in terms of spending the least and getting the best outcomes. And they've got all sorts of other social safety net programs to the left of us, stronger unions and all that. And guess what? Working class folks are still being fucking fooled into voting for Nazis there. So there's just on some level, you do your best. Maybe you can win one or two percent of them back, but that's not why you're doing the policies you're doing because you want to help your base. You want to help people that are suffering economically. And that may, that includes some of them, but you don't do it to win them over. No. You're not going to. No, you're never going to. Never going to. It's just never going to work. It's like McDonald's doesn't waste time trying to advertise to people that are vegans or are never going to eat there. It's just it's a waste of money. It's just not the one, there. Yeah, the ones that, that voted like for Donald Trump reluctantly, and I, even voting for him that way makes me sick, but I'm just point making yeah. a point. The ones that voted for some working class folks who were poisoned enough on Hillary because of the Russians and others who could vote for Donald Trump reluctantly, there that's the kind of people that Sherrod Brown, there's a five or ten percent of them can win over. So yes, you have a shot with if you're if you fit in there of winning over this very small contingent of them. But five or ten percent of them is like whatever percent, because we're still winning 30% of the working class. It's this very small sliver that you can win over. But again, it's not going to make the difference in most elections. It's very small. Most of them are Nazis because they're Nazis, because they believe they, they get told this shit and they believe it. And that is not how those are not the folks you should be aiming your policies at. They, they, our policies have the effect, if they're good, of that they'll help them. Sure. We're still never getting their fucking votes. I know. And not only that, they'll, they, they do what the Republicans do, which is they take the benefits of something that Democrats fought for and voted for and they didn't vote for and then claim hey, look credit. the stimulus look at like oh, i built this new God. bridge it was me I, oh you yeah. voted against that oh p loans you lazy people on welfare oh you're gonna let me take eighty thousand dollars chuck grassley was like 147 years old and shouldn't even be allowed in congress anymore and but he took i don't know he's a multi-millionaire but he took how much for his fucking farm i don't even remember anymore he's shameless yeah, disgusting. Okay, one more question before I release you. You've talked a lot about this whole the whole Armenia situation. I want to talk about that because it's complicated and something that doesn't get talked about in the news very often. As I understand it, you're up in the Caucasus Mountains there. You have Armenia, you have Azerbaijan. There's territories within those two countries that sort of intermingle. Armenia yes. is the world's oldest Christian country, continuous. It was the first country that became Christian that still exists. Azerbaijan is Islamic, so there's tensions there. Yep. Uh, you have a breakaway province called Nagorno-Karabakh, which is basically an Armenian enclave within what's territorially... Armenians. Yeah. And and has been like quasi-independent for, I don't know, 25 years now. And yep. There, there's a war, there's a ceasefire. Tensions have started to escalate more recently. So what's going on there? What should people know? What can we do about it? Yeah, there's a, a, a group that I've done work with. And then now it's become sort of a passion of mine pushing this because obviously 
we were I mean, Biden, I think, was the first time we even acknowledged the Armenian genocide. Yes. The United Kingdom still hasn't done it. Others still don't. The EU, because of natural gas and other reasons, the, guy, the way fossil fuels corrupt the world is just, they still are, they invite Aliyev, who's a corrupt, corrupt kleptocrat, and from your stuff on Trump, that at one point there was going to be a Trump Tower Baku. Absolutely. I believe it was Ali of son in law who was like the rapper or whatever. I mean, my God, these people are just no talent, whatever. But hey, I'm an ad. You better buy my albums. We'll line you up against the wall. So you've got Christian and Muslim, and there's tensions there. But also, Armenia on the, oh, what's the group that rates democracies? There's a group that rates the health. Their democracy is healthier than ours right now. All okay. right. So people are like questioning Armenia's democracy. Yeah. They have a higher rating on the scale than we do. It's, it's a Freedom House, I think. It's fucking embarrassing. Yeah, I'm it is. happy for Armenia. I'm embarrassed for America. They're also a democracy. Aliyev is a kleptocrat and is a vicious tyrant and has gotten rich off of in any any number of pieces with plenty of evidence, stealing state resources, the usual thing. So before, are both Armenia, out of protecting themselves, and Azerbaijan both had agreements with Russia. But Putin, in the end, understands what's in his interests. He wants to get the band back together and put either, hell, forget the Soviet empire. I think he wants the czarist empire to be put back together. And all of these areas are spheres of influence or were part of their empire at times. So a couple of days before he invaded Ukraine, people, if you believe in coincidences, and I know you don't, Aliyev was meeting with him in Moscow. Clearly some green lights were being given to each other. To, and it's in his interest for there to be attacks and things, taking some of the attention away from Ukraine going on there. It's in his interest in terms of the way he's viewed by the world. It's in his interest because if things are unstable there, everybody calls Russia in to be an independent mediator and oh, Russia increases their influence there and gets more access maybe to a pipeline. Tied into this too is Erdogan, a good old Erdogan who hired Michael Flynn to kidnap somebody out of rendition somewhere out of the country. And I don't remember, there's other American folks that it was, is Tulsi Gabbard one of the ones that the, he was also corrupting? You may know this uh, He was the one also that, whose lackeys beat up protesters in front of the White yes. House. And he had Trump on speed dial. Trump talked to him more right. than any other leader, which I was surprised right. to find out. Yeah. But there were a couple other like members of Congress groups, wing groups that have been heavily, I remember it's the prayer breakfast, like they've got their claws. In. And so Obviously, if you know the Armenian genocide, you understand that Turkey was the one who committed that. And so Turkish nationalists like, oh, I don't know, Mehmet Oz, who was good buds with Erdogan, um, yep. which I pointed out a lot during that time that we would literally, he was a Turkish citizen. He'd fought in the Turkish military that this, that we, this might be the first time we've literally, if they put him on the intelligence committee, have a Turkish spy yeah. better closer to Erdogan than he is to, than he ever was to Pennsylvania. I actually spent time living, <laughs> actually he did spend a little time, <laughs> I think, living in, in but point being, he was using the in-laws house there for a while, one of his 47 houses. So what I do is I point out, so you've got, as you pointed, Artsakh is another area there. It's Naborno karabakh and they're, they are surrounded. I'm trying to think of the best way to describe it. Think of like how, how we do an airlift to West Berlin because right, they're surrounded exactly. by, by the Soviet slash East German territory. That's what it's surrounded by. They need access to this road to get to Armenia. But this, the, the Aliyev and the Azerbaijanis made up this fake that they were going to do something, I don't remember, with fossil fuels, the irony, right? These people just look at you in the face and tell you what they're doing is such a fascist trait, right? <laughs> and so they sent in these ecological of activists to block them because they didn't want them burning fossil fuels on that road. Utter bullshit, completely seen through. One of the PR companies had hired some professor in the United Kingdom to write, and he found out it was for Azerbaijan, and he backed out and fucking called them out on the whole thing and how it was all bullshit. And he's a big climate. So that's well, not to interrupt, but Baku and is was one of the first places where oil was discovered. And yeah. in the Russian Empire and Soviet Union, that yeah. was the center of the entire before Saudi Arabia, before anywhere. Baku right. so was you, the place. So you've got oil and you've got natural gas, and they want to run a pipeline through Armenia. And they wanna they, they so there there's chaos, but there's as there often is, there's reasons for this. They want Armenia, they figure the US and will be dealing with Ukraine, dealing with other stuff. We're not going to stand up and risk lives. Or, but Nancy Pelosi went over there and stood up with them. A few Republicans from less MAGA-ish wing have also done that. But it, it's a simple story. It is a corrupt dictator, vicious dictator, killing people in a democracy. So they block this road. So these 120,000 ethnic Armenians are being subject to starvation and fr freezing temperatures. 
and the UN is failing. And I hate to say this because I don't want to like like undercut institutions that the right does this all the time. This amba former ambassador, or foreign ambassador to the UN from Armenia wrote this op-ed that I shared the other day all about how Kofi Annan had these things he called first principles at the UN and said, if we will not, if we allow politics to get in the way of going and stopping genocides, then what's our point? Yeah. And after East Timor and after Rwanda and after Bosnia, that we, if we don't learn those lessons. So the UN right now isn't doing enough. The EU is staying there and you've got what's her face, the EU head of the EU shaking hands with, with Alia for the cameras, which makes me want to vomit. And I would argue even Blinken, we're not doing enough. We're doing certainly more than the EU, at least we've recognize the genocide at least we've sent our leaders over there to say we stand with armenia but we're not doing enough we're not you're not the way to hurt them is the way you hurt russia it's with sanctions they literally they're a petro state that's all they got going for them you hurt them there you hurt them but it's like the dictators club again aliyev putin erdogan who are killing people innocent people and the media is almost nowhere to be found so i'm working with this group birthright armenia what's an american group i'm not working with any folks in Armenia, but I'm working with them and trying to publicize what's going on there as much as possible because it breaks my heart. And it's another place where, call it what you will, call it a genocide, a Holocaust occurred, you know, and we're apparently going to let it happen again. And so I've been doing work there. Are you a heavy metal fan or no? Not really. No, I'm okay. more of a, but go ahead. I just started to ask, my, my main genre is a little more hard rock, classic rock, but I like a little heavy metal here and there, Metallica, some stuff. But so one of the lead singer of a band called System of a Down, his name is Serge Tankian, a heavy metal band. He's based, he's Armenian American based in LA, just an amazing guy. He's also a pu published poetry and he does art and this and that. He's been incredibly helpful because he's got a bigger, much bigger microphone. And so I've done some work with him in pushing out like a lot of what's going on there. He writes songs about it. He does art about it. And so he helps in, in a lot and he's a terrific guy because he doesn't have to do any of this stuff yeah. and he does and so that's helped too that we've got a few people like that jesus i wish kim kardashian would do a little bit more uh, yeah. but a brand to worry about or something so we've had some at least semi people with relatively big names who are armenian speak out that one name would be hugely helpful but has done very little yeah and we do what we can so that's what's going on and people should just know about it because if you we follow international affairs if you know what's going on in ukraine if you know what's going what's going on to the tigray population if you're, if we head over to, to Eastern Africa, if these are things that our new media once upon a time covered. Um, yeah. There's, they're few and far between now. And I hate to say this, but I really do think it's racist. And I've got family that one quarter of my family is from Odessa. So I, I obviously have an interest, familial, familial interest, but also human interest in not wanting anything awful to happen to Ukraine. But at the same time as we should be showing what's happening to to people that are being victimized who are white in in our in Ukraine, we should also be showing up a, a fuck of a lot more about what's going on in to the Tigray population. I'm probably mispronouncing it, and I apologize. Tigray, it may be, and to Armenians and other folks around the world. So, I do my best on this one, and it's a client that you know, every once in a while I get lucky, and there's a lot of things that I really care passionately about. But this is this is as pure and as good a thing as I've ever done. So I'm so glad that I got the opportunity to spend some of my time talking about it and working on it. Yeah, good. Well, thanks for doing that. I think it is important. I think when people are just normies who have platforms on Twitter and elsewhere pick certain beats to cover and hone in on, I think it's really helpful. But thanks for getting the word out about that. Because sure. I, I, I agree with you that it's really important. And uh, it's ironic. You mentioned Kim Kardashian. That's was one of the most famous people in the whole world is Armenian American. That's how it goes. That's she's how made a few statements and put a few things in her Instagram. And I'm appreciative of that because that's always very helpful. But with the audience she has, if she were willing to speak out on it all the time, it would be amazing the attention it would get. But yeah, it totally would. We'll keep trying. It totally would. Yeah. But thank you for the work that you do. Thanks. This has been a great sure. conversation. Thanks so much for for taking the time. You're on Twitter. It's just your name, right? It's at Cliff Schechter. So I'm just at Cliff Schechter on Twitter, which is easy. As you pointed out at the beginning of the show, no second H, yep. S-C-H-E-C-T-E-R and on YouTube, we're, we're, we've had a lot of videos. We've been had a lot of growth lately. I'm excited about that platform. It's a little different. It's just at C Schechter. So okay. it's just the first initial and then my last name and you can, and find me in either place. And I don't know, there may be other places in the future because I just got told I have to change my two-factor identification on Twitter and 
Elon is doing a great job of trying to extort people into getting his Twitter blue, which will not work with me. So I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, it's a, I suspect that's going to go away, but that's what the fuck do I know? Anyway, no more about, we don't want to end with an image of that jackass. Okay. And let's end with, hopefully, <laughs> let's all do things to, to, to bring transparency, let's say, to, to the dictators and sociopaths and narcissists and bad people out there. Cause, because you only hear the bad stuff, yes, but a lot of good stuff's happening too, and we're beating them in a lot of places, and let's also talk about that. Amen. Amen. Cliff, thanks so much for taking the time. Great to see you. Thanks for having me on. Seriously, great conversation.